Hey guys, it's Sharon from Digital Nomad Quest. I'm super excited to have Brandon from Investment Joy here today. How are you doing today? I am just peachy. Awesome. Yeah, I came across your YouTube channel just like randomly and I was so amazed by all that you've accomplished. You've gotten a ton of rental properties, laundromats, just like a lot of stuff in mobile home parks too, right? And you yep. just expanded so much and it was really cool seeing how like cheap you could get rental properties and stuff like that it actually inspired me i ended up getting something in texas i think i told you about it that was like twenty three thousand. we'll see how it goes but you know you inspired me to do that and it was really cool so yeah maybe you can tell us about yourself real quickly my name is brandon schlichter i'm a 34 year old real estate investor i live right outside columbus ohio my own uh, as of today 140 rentals um, I figured up the total and it 32 houses, six, 46 trailers. Once the trailer park's up and running, a warehouse, three laundromats, and then whatever the remaining number is, those are um, multifamilies, uh, mm -hmm. most of which is small multifamilies. The largest I have is a sixplex or sevenplex. I've probably got 20, 30 units, du 30, 20 or 30 units of duplexes, and then one whole triplex, and then a bunch of quads. So wow. that's the like whole inner the whole review or portfolio I have because I know I've had a lot of people ask how many houses I own so I have to be able to quote right off the bat 32 so geez that's crazy when did you start with all of this stuff back in 07 I helped my brother buy a single family detached house back then you could do something called all day financing which were our affectionately titled liar loans where you essentially call a mortgage broker who's real creative and say hey i want to buy a rental property and he would say all right here's the special and we bought a rental he bought a rental using my credit because he didn't have really a, enough income or i can't remember whether it was a, a credit problem or an income problem we called a mortgage company they said all right we're going to send you some paperwork just sign it and they sent us a form with a whole bunch of job information for me that they came up with. It was really creative. And we still have that, or he still has that rental property. But at the technical peak of Central Ohio, at least up until recently, the highest technical point of the market was April 2007. And we bought this house back then. And it's still to this day making about $300 a month. Wow. And it's made reliable income all the way through the low decline till September 08 when, you know, the cliffs dro started dropping everything off. Never had a problem finding renters, never really had much vacancy to talk about. I think it was vacant. It's been vacant for two or three weeks over almost, it'll be year 13 in April. So that was kind of the start. Then we helped him go out and buy an apartment complex. And uh, he still has the apartment complex. It, it's a four, five unit, I think. Then that was December 07. Then the mortgage crisis happened, and I could, we could buy. I, I wanted to buy properties too, could mm -hmm. buy them. All of that creative, amazing financing, the um, apartment complex, we did 100% commercial multifamily finance on it with car titles. We found a bank that would trade lien free cars as your down payment. So we, he went out and found some people that we knew that had cars with three titles on them and handed them to the bank. And once we built up only, it was like 10% equity in the property. They gave it the titles back. You know, we told the people, well, we'll, we'll pay you with the apartment income. And it worked. And not to say that those kinds of deals completely disappeared. But I made the really, really poor assumption in 08, 09, while I was still being a uh, still real estate agent doing affiliate marketing, online marketing, I kind of transitioned from real estate, heavy sales to the world of online marketing. I kind of had got this idea or thought process that all oh, that kind of financing has disappeared. In reality, it didn't disappear. It just changed. So I made this real poor choice and I kind of knocked myself out of the market till 2013. I had a windfall. I had uh, $25,000 or 50, actually $50,000. I sold a business of mine and I had, that was enough for me to live off of for almost two years, about a year and a half. And I made the decision, I'm going to figure out what and do whatever it takes to get rental property. My brother's had this apartment. He's had these houses and it's just, he's done great off them. Even through the recession, the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression, he did really well off of them. I thought, well, I'm going to just do whatever it takes. So it took me a grand total of like three months. Mm -hmm. I contacted a lawyer. He drew up some paperwork for me. I started making calls. I started trolling online forums, websites mm -hmm. for people that had, if we want to get real, real uh, technical, they were Bitcoin forums. Um, and I found people that had recently got rich off Bitcoin and it, who were cashing it out for currency. 
and they had all the, the, these large cash reserves. I said, hey, you want to start sinking that money into Southern Ohio in real estate? And it was very easy. And it was like, oh my gosh, within two or three months, I had enough money to buy three houses. And I put very little of my own capital in it. And essentially, since that day, I've put almost nothing in it, just doing creative finance after creative finance. That source dried up relatively quick, uh, probably lasted a year. I bought 18 rentals using that kind of finance method. After 18 rentals, people just started calling me on a regular basis saying, hey, Brandon, do you need money? Do you have any properties? Is there anything you want to buy? And I started telling people that were contacting me. I said, hey, if you're serious about buying property in Ohio, start wiring money to my account. <laughs> I kid you not, somebody did. They wired 90K to me and I had never met this person. And, you know, I, as crazy as that sounds, I went down to the bank. I opened up a bank account because uh, I, you know, I, I finally don't give my account number off to some of these people. And, you know, they wired money to me. I'm like, holy crap, it works. Wait, you know, how, did I, they, I just, how did they find you? Like, uh, bigger, uh, that, that specific guy was off biggerpockets.com. I got okay. featured in a uh, email newsletter or something like that. I had a forum post about how I bought my first 18 rentals. And I had three or four people say, hey, you need money. And I said, uh, I don't really need money because my plan at that point was to do the B, triple R deal, buy, renovate, rent, refinance. Mm. That was my plan at that time. And I said, I don't really want to deal with creative finance, hard money, that kind of thing, because the interest rate's typically a lot higher than a bank. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, if you think you're in a point where you'd be wanting to spend up to about half a million dollars with me, um, not immediately, but mm. over the course of time, I would take on another investor and this guy wired 90 K to me just like, you know, like that. It was crazy. And uh, th then that took me up to 40 or so. And it's just, it nonstop, you know, as time goes on, you start having to pursue people and hunt people down and it's mm -hmm. just the money starts coming to you. And then, you know, it's like with the trailer park, I've talked about the trailer park deal a few times. I didn't want to buy anything. I was at 90 rentals. Mm -hmm. I was, or 90, the 90, Three ninety four rentals. I was happy. I was content. Everything was good. And I had a guy call me. He says, "Brain, I got a million dollars to spend." And that that's enough to pique my interest. I was like, "Okay, a million dollars. I could go buy something big. I've never mm -hmm. bought a, a big project before." So in my mind, I was thinking like a large warehouse, big commercial type project. And the next day, my good friend Sean, that I talk about on YouTube pretty often, he called me. He said, "Brain, I'm selling my trailer park. I said, How mm -hmm. much you want for it?" And he nice. said. You know, three hundred twenty-five thousand uh -huh. dollars. Well, okay, that gives me a budget of six hundred and fifty, you know, whatever, six six seventy-five uh -huh. to spend on the trailer park and renovations and upgrades and things like that. So, I thought, well, this, I'm going to take this as a sign that I need to buy a trailer park, and that's what we did. And it's been a real creative disaster, nightmare, weird <laughs> thing. It'll 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 be a very very good performing asset. But essentially, when you have somebody invest a lot of neglect into a property. It takes all the more investment for an investor trying to fix it up. You know, it, it's just one of those things where I didn't, I thought it would probably take a year to get the trailers for the trailer park. I ended up buying all my trailers that I needed in one go. They were essentially shutting down a trailer park in Columbus. And I uh, uh, found a guy off Facebook and I, I messaged him and said, how many trailers can you sell? And he said, as many as you need. And I'm thinking, oh, this guy, this guy doesn't understand. I need 30 trailers. And no one has 30 trailers to sell me. He said, Brandon, I have 150. <laughs> so I went through, yeah, so I went through and picked 29, 30 trailers out to wow. move uh, mm -hmm. 35 miles south of Columbus. So Dude, there's so many things you're like is bringing it, up right now. It's it? like crazy. There's so much to unpack here. Like you got this whole journey yeah. though. So that led to laundromats and then vending machines as well, right? The, the, the laundromats were before the trailer park, uh, the laundromat. That came about because the landlord that evicted me, my family, when I was six years old, he's been following all my crap on Facebook. And he said, the next time you need money, consider giving me a call. And, you know, it's one of those things over the course of time. It's not that I, you know, my it's not that my parents ever, like, really disliked the guy. They just had a hard time comprehending. Why would you do business like that? Why would you kick a family out of their house? You know, as time goes on, I'm a landlord. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> there's two sides to the story. So he called me up probably two years ago and said, hey, if you need money anymore, let me know because I hear that your yields are a lot better than what I'm getting elsewhere. And I said, well, sure. So I, get, I sent him a trial thing. I said, hey, you want to buy a laundromat? They're great. 
tax write-offs because essentially you can accelerate the depreciation mm -hmm. in almost every case with the equipment. So it ends up being very tax advantageous. Mm -hmm. So I bought two laundromats and then just, it's a, it's the whirlwind of all this crap that I'm doing even before YouTube and YouTube has just taken, added another order of magnitude to it. Yeah. We bought these two laundromats. We're working on them. We're fixing them up. The, the two that I have that we're working on still were ones that I really didn't want. The one that I really, really wanted is the one that all the YouTubes are video on. On I made the elder, the, the guy, Wesley, he owned the laundromat. He died of cancer in 14 or 15. He, uh, his mom ended up controlling the estate with the laundromat equipment. I made an offer to her two or three years ago. She rejected my offer. She sold it to another guy. The other guy kind of ran it into the ground because he gave it to a family member as a pet project and they just weren't ready for it. He mothballed the laundromat. Then I came in and essentially and said, hey, I would love this laundromat. I will do whatever it takes um, to get this laundromat because it's in such a good location. It might not look like it in the video, but there's an apartment complex with 200 units next door. Mm. And I figure it's just a good location, a good commercial location. And I got him to sell or finance almost the whole thing with very minimal cash down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since I'm all about creative finance and making things look interesting, I figured oh, I'll get somebody to hard, hard money loan, all the rehab money and mm -hmm. the down payment. So I have no money out of pocket on it. Just doing these weird, nice. crazy little deals. Um, so a lot of these are yeah. kind of like from other people's money type of thing that you're able to get uh, that finance. Well, like I said, in the earlier part of this conversation, I only have 25K out of pocket right now on this whole deal. So I've spent $25,000 out of my pocket to get 140 rentals. Now the caveat there, and I get a lot of complaints, I do carry about 1.65 million in debt. Mm -hmm. And that I mean, freaks a lot of people out. It's good and, debt. Uh, <laughs> it's good debt. And my debt service costs are only about 12, 13K a month. So mm -hmm. at full capacity with the freaking trailer park, we'll be at over 70 K. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, it's really good debt. Yeah, for um, sure. But, <laughs> but on the other side, I've been extremely aggressive with this. My risk tolerance is a lot higher than I think a lot of other people are. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, my buddy, Sean, he always says, the nice thing is with real estate, there's a hundred ways to make money in it. And just because I do things a real specific way with these ultra creative deals with investors and stuff. That's just, that's the way I do them. My buddy, mm -hmm. Sean, he does them a completely different way. We know like 20 other guys in our local RIA and every single investor does structures them different. They use different kinds of financing and they go for different kinds of properties. And it's mm -hmm. really this, to me, it's kind of the neat thing about real estate is you don't have to be enemies with everybody in your town mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. your, your local community. You can all kind of work together to try and get things done. Yeah. Because, you know, even in a town where the laundromat is, there's only 20, the, the city population is only 23,000. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. yet we feel like we can help each other and be assets to each other, not enemies and mm -hmm. be disadvantageous, you know, trying to, trying to, go after each other yeah because um, i hear i hear that a lot with people and they say oh no another investor is going to get the deal i've got to fight over it and i i agree you know you need to be have that passion you need to be able to have that zest to go out and fight and take over the world but you don't have to get in you know shouting matches with other people in real estate you don't have to be enemies in real estate because there's just so many ways to make money yeah and you know in a lot of areas they need more investors I, 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 I make this statement to people. I need like five of me to supply enough housing in my part of Ohio. Um, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. There's, there's just not enough. There's, you know, how many times do people talk about a housing crisis or they talk about affordable housing and mm -hmm. they talk about how the market isn't supplying enough rentals. I, I hear it every single day. I, I see city council meetings, no, affordable housing. We need affordable housing. The only people that could bring about affordable housing are more investors. And yeah. I see mm -hmm. so much demand and there's just this little supply. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I think like, you know, I'm from the Bay Area and then there's like too many investors here. Where it's like too saturated. So it's cool to hear from you that like, you know, there's areas that need investors and need help. Oh, yeah. And yeah. So I'm like, a, I'm, I'm looking for those places. <laughs> right. yeah. Essentially, from my perspective, it's the entirety of the Midwest and South. Okay. Hmm. I just I see deals all the freaking time. Wow. Well, yeah. But then again, it had one of those situations where if you're buying out of your, you have to have good management and you have to have a good system in order to locate those properties. Cause you know, I get messages all the time with my, the size of my YouTube channel and people message me and they say, Oh, I can't find a deal. And I said, oh, I bet you money that I could find you a deal where mm -hmm. you live. And it's like, I'm trying to put together a portfolio deal in San Bernardino County right now. Oh. Um, really 
decent package. It's like five or six units for three fifty, three seventy five. Um, okay. Um, so you like cap rates on? You like studied the market. Thing. Sorry, um, you studied oh, the market yeah. of that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I know one of the largest landlords in San Bernardino. Well, I think he's large. He's worth nine figures. Um, wow. I get, I, to me, that's large. He's that got large. 350, 400 rentals in mm -hmm. San Bernardino. Oh, um, crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, from my perspective, it's like there's all these ways to find deals and find properties and get deals done and locate property. I'm big on social media. Mm -hmm. My buddy sends tax link, handwritten tax delinquent letters. I know other guys that they're all about Google AdWords. They buy Google search traffic. I know mm -hmm. some guys that source deals off freaking Instagram and Snapchat. Yeah. And it's just like, to me, it's like this game. I, my brother and I grew up playing all these um, video games dealing with money and finance and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, you know, now I am in the real life version of the game trying to figure out creative ways to source and find houses. And it's, to me, it's enjoyable because, you know, I get a lot of nice comments from people in my local community saying, Hey, I, I see that you're finally, you're, you know, you're, you're trying to create more housing and trying to get things done. So, um, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, you said it's kind of like a video game. Like, was it always like this, you always had this entrepreneurial spirit and you wanted to kind of make money and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> my brother and I, we, we started our own on selling paintball equipment online back when we were 14 or 15 years old, just as a oh. way to, because we were, we were relatively poor growing up. Uh -huh. And so doing paintball tournaments and that sort of thing was extremely expensive, but we just didn't have, our parents didn't have a way to pay for it. So my brother and I said, we need to figure out a way to make money to do it. So let's start an online paintball store. And we did. There were, I, I, I tell people, if I would have known just the basic business principles back then that I know now, I would, I would have been a millionaire probably at 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And we were selling stuff with a three and 400% markup on eBay. Oh, and wow. then we were doing, oh yeah. And we, every single thing that we got our hands on would sell within three days on eBay. As Many, much, as our hustlers. You know, <laughs> yeah. So if if you would talk to anybody, I'm sure most of the people watching your channel are like, oh, so 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 obviously Brandon and his brother loaded up, bought a dump truck to just fill full <laughs> of stuff to sell. That's not what we did at all, mm -hmm. because we had no concept of basic accounting. We didn't even know how to operate a spreadsheet. <laughs> all these things, you're like, oh yeah, you should do that. That's not what we did. We would look at stuff and like, well. This is fun. This thing over here is fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you know, now at 34, it's like, well, this thing that was fun didn't make money. But this thing that was over here that was less fun on, you know, the funness scale, this is fun, but it doesn't make money. This fun thing, this not less fun thing down here makes a crap load of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, if this, at least a smart one, you'd say, OK, well, then you scale this. That's not what we did at 15, 14, mm -hmm. 15 years old. We're making $50 an hour at 15 that's, years old. That's crazy. Doing custom, <laughs> doing custom work for people. Is yeah. that the thing we scaled? Of course it wasn't. It was the fun thing that uh, we got to travel all over Ohio and Michigan and did other another aspect of the business. And it was a total time sink and cash sink. It made us no money. It made it wait. It used used all of our time. It was fun. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice and fun. You guys but, are like twin brothers, right? Yeah, or yeah, I, I think I saw that. Yeah. And that do you guys partner on like the deals you guys are doing now? No, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I try, we try to avoid doing deals together because it, it's this weird situation where I, I, I make this terrible assumption and it's, it's, it, it comes down to my inability to, de to delegate. Uh, okay. I, I am working so hard on this with the YouTube channel. I mean, the YouTube channel is on fire. Yeah. And I've got to delegate more and more and more of my real estate stuff, which is always one of those things I keep telling myself, oh, I'm going to do that. And I haven't done it. And now, mm -hmm. you know, in January, my YouTube channel made 32, 33 grand, which wow. for me in the Midwest means I can live like a king if I keep that up. Because, you know, like I said, I, up to this point, I pretty much reinvested all my income in cash back in more rentals to scale. So that, you know, That's crazy. Going back to risk taller. Yeah. So now this YouTube stuff's making crap loads of money. And I should have everything systemized and delegated and set up really nice for my rental stuff, which is not, you know, I try to be honest with everybody and, and not make it come off. Like I know everything about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to sell myself short and say, I don't know anything about real estate or anything about finance, but I find that every day I've got to push myself and grow more so that I can scale up and do, do a better job tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's just, it comes back to these things that I try to figure out, you know, 
What am I doing wrong? How can I improve? And, you know, delegation is one of those things right now. High management, I'm terrible on. High delegation, <laughs> I'm terrible on. It's like you, you watch any of the, the uh, big finance guys and they give you this nice base of skills that you have to have. And I, I've told a lot of people, you don't need every single one of them to make money. You just mm-hmm. need, as you, the, the more you have, the better off you are. I watch some of these guys and how they manage every hour of their day, essentially. And I think, man, that probably would be a good thing for me to implement. But I, I don't do that. That's mm. why uh, my kids had the phone when you tried starting the podcast. <laughs> they had turned off my notifications. That's you think a guy that's uh, organized and uh, delegates time wouldn't have the phone that he uses for all of his YouTube content and stuff <laughs> like that and the rental stuff. You did, you'd think that it would be unlockable by a 10-year-old kid to play Minecraft, but it is. I mean, so. you know, whatever you're doing is working anyway. So, like, even if you don't do the delegation, like, you're killing it right now, you know? I'm, I'm um, doing well. I'm very blessed. I'm happy. But there's 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 a lot of room for growth, So at least from my perspective. So. Awesome. I mean, you also, I think in the very beginning when you're talking about your journey, you said you were actually diving into, like, affiliate marketing and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So you were doing a lot of online business stuff. You just decided, yep. you know what, let's go into rentals um, and more like. That was 09, 012. I could talk for probably the next six hours on just affiliate marketing and SEO and stuff like that. Because um, the tech business that I sold that I got the 50K windfall was an SEO company. Oh, I had mm-hmm. started um, because back in 09, 10 and part of 11, I was doing a crap load of affiliate marketing in 2009. It wasn't my cut, but I did about 1.2 million in affiliate ebook sales. Wow. Through SEO. What made you stop? Um, that, you're, you're like, nah. Oh, like. Because um, everything I did was gray hat. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. It's just for the way that I was scaling my business so quickly to sell stuff on SEO was gray hat. Okay, and yeah. it's just like it's constantly churning processes to mm. uh, rank pages and stuff. And it's just like every three or four months I had to start all over again. Yeah. Google, Google, Algorithm uh, change. Yeah. yeah. Um, everything changed and I had to do something new. And then I built the SEO business in 11 and 12 and mm-hmm. it was doing, it was doing good. And instead of me changing strategies and doing things differently every three to four months, like I was doing, I was having to change it every six to nine months. And, mm-hmm. I, and you know, I started sitting down and really considering what they, some of these landlords that I ran into in my County that uh, they had been doing the same freaking thing the same way since 1950. Hmm. And they were still making more money than I was. Oh, I see. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'm changing my strategy every six to nine months. And these guys haven't changed their, their strategy in 40 plus years. Hmm. Maybe I should really try to figure out how to do exactly what they're doing, but implement better processes and strategies. Hmm. And here we are. Um, yeah. I, I kind of transitioned from SEO and affiliate marketing and all that, all that stuff to real estate, uh, taking a lot of those things that I learned in affiliate marketing. Holy crap. All that stuff was stupid valuable. Nice. Um, yeah. It's like, it's, it's the reason my freak, my rental page, my rental Facebook page is larger than most brokers in my state. Hmm. Um, just cause I figured out how to scale sense. a Facebook page without spending much money on it. Yeah, like you're ranking your sites and stuff, right? So then people find you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do with, deal with much SEO stuff. I, okay. I, I really, I'm not, I'm not as happy about SEO today as I was mm. five, six or seven years ago. Everybody's on social media, Mark, on social media. And the thing that I love about social media, and it's, it's like, how, how did you contact me? Well, you, you messaged me through Instagram. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I find that I can manage relationships even as basic as they are, as far as marketing and mm-hmm. contacting people, I can manage relationships with people so efficiently on social media as compared to SEO. Mm-hmm. To me, it provides more value to me and to the customer. You know, I can post the house on my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. I'll get uh, 30, 40,000 reach in two days. I'll generate 250, 300 messages and I can churn through them. It takes me 30 to 45 seconds to personally respond to each message. Nice. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and the lead value of that customer, that data, those kinds of things, whether it's, um, I'm, I'm hitting Facebook to market a house I have for rent or Mm -hmm. I'm hitting the market to try and find a new acquisition. I can manage those relationships a heck of a lot quicker. And then I can lateral from, hey, you're interested in this house to, hey, I'm sorry, we just filled this vacancy. I would love to find an opportunity in this community for a similar property. Do you know anybody in this area that might want to sell? 
Oh, Do you know nice. of any abandoned houses? You know, anybody that might be delinquent on their taxes? Do you know any older people that they're to a point they can't handle it anymore? You know, mm -hmm. I can ask those mm -hmm. questions in a copy and paste format. It looks very, very official. It looks very, very personable. And I can, I can churn 250 of those messages in mm -hmm. 30 minutes if, if, if I'm on the hunt for, some, for someone. Yeah. And those are things that I learned in affiliate marketing and SEO and all that uh -huh. stuff. So then I can scale how I want to or efficiently manage my time on the marketing aspect. I mean, awesome. it's not like I, I'm one of those guys that schedules my day, but I, I know how to kind of squeeze a dollar out of um, what I'm doing. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. So, I mean, that leads me to, you're talking about kind of securing deals through social media and stuff like that. Like, you know, if someone were to start out with like real estate, what would you recommend for kind of finding these deals? Uh, like and hustling to get them? I would say find an area that you're passionate about. I know that if you're in the Bay Area and there's, I need to get a list and say that this strategy works, except if you're in the Bay Area, LA, <laughs> Seattle, and New York City. I mm -hmm. mean, it can work, but it just doesn't work as efficiently because I had a guy call me from Westchester, New York, or mm -hmm. message me on Discord. And he's like, there's no deals here. And I said, you want to see if I can work my magic? <laughs> and he said, yes, I'm in West, you know, I'm in, there are market medians, 1.4 million. And I said, give me your requirements. What's the, the worst property, the farthest out that you'll take right now? And he gave me his specifications. I said, all right, okay. So I spent 15 minutes and just started, started churning through stuff. And I found something for 450K for him. And oh, he's like, mm -hmm. holy crap, I've never seen anything under a million dollars before. <laughs> They're out there. Yeah. Um, how did that happen so, though? Like what were the steps um, for that? One, it depends on how long you're going to be on the market. Do you want to, do you want to get a property fast? Do you want mm -hmm. to get a property cheap? If you mm. want cheap and a lot of them, I'm all about community building. Go mm. and throw yourself out in a locality. It doesn't have to be physically, but you have to say, hey, you have to say to yourself, so then you can go on and tell other people, hey, I want to invest in this community. I want to invest in this geographic area. I want to invest in this place. And then you say, how do, you know, how do I want to contact people? Well, it could be those ugly yellow letters. I'm not a fan of them, but they mm -hmm. work. So then it's a number game. How many contacts can you make? How mm -hmm. efficiently can you do it? I'm big on Facebook. I like Facebook groups, specifically mm -hmm. buy, sell, trade groups, real estate groups. There's mm -hmm. a crap load of wholesaler groups on you on uh, Facebook mm -hmm. that are very localized. Yeah, um, we've got a we've got a great one in Columbus, Ohio. I talk to people all the time that can't find. They've been in Columbus for three years. They can't find a deal. Mm -hmm. I can go on. There's a group in Columbus called Cream, C R E A M, on uh, Facebook, and mm -hmm. they 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 wholesale deals, and you can get a house 50, 60k in an area where they're 100, 120k, so 50 percent off retail, mm -hmm. almost instantaneously, and they're by wholesalers, and the wholesalers marking them up 10 to 15 thousand yeah. off right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you could start with wholesaling, you start with Facebook, but get in that area and say, I'm going to invest in this area, and then start figuring out a way to contact everybody. And say, hey, I, I am an investor. I want to invest in a community. I want to build more housing supply. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. want to drive down the price of because more supply means prices are going to go down organically. They might not go down a lot, but um, every new investor that comes on board has a, in my opinion, every new investor brings value to a community because yeah. they're providing a service that didn't exist there before. Yeah. And if, if and if you provide it efficiently, you know, mm -hmm. it helps everybody out. And they just start talking to people. I've done. I've knocked. I've knocked on doors and I've got deals calling all call local landlords, ask if they want to sell. It just comes down to how much time do you want? Um, there's stuff that if you've got money, I mean, you could start off with mailing postcards and doing all that stuff. You could hire mm -hmm. a VA, yeah. you have a VA, just call all the landlords. Call you, you could, you could hire some guy to go physically knock on all the landlord's doors for, you know, 12, 12 bucks an hour. Yeah. Um, there's just, mm -hmm. there, there's no way you just got to put, there's no one way that works really well or do, or that it's a surefire. I, I don't think there's any surefire things, but there's just everything works at some percentage. And you've got to find out, you know, do you have the cash reserves to spend 5K on advertising? Well, you probably could find a deal. Do you have mm -hmm. a, a lot of time, but no money? Well, you could, mm -hmm. you could knock on doors. You can make phone calls. You could hand write letters. Yeah. I hand wrote, I hand wrote 135 letters. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't want any houses. I just wanted to see if it war would work. I hand wrote 135 letters. I had 50 people call me. Wait, so did you like target, did you target specific homes or you just? At every single landlord in a zip code that owned a property with less than 30% mortgage payoff, meaning mm -hmm. they already paid off at least 70% or they were cash free. 
non LLC. So they weren't in an entity. They were actually, their name was on the tax record rather than a corp or an LLC. I sent out 135 handwritten postcards wow. or uh, <laughs> letters and I had 50 out of 135. So that, that's what, crazy. 35 ish percent rate. Jeez. I talked to guys that they'll bulk mail postcards at, uh, they'll, they'll bulk mail 5,000 postcards. And if they get five calls, that's one tenth of one percent. They they they're happy with that callback rate. Mm-hmm. And so I've asked them. I said, "You ever handwrite a letter?" Well, no. It take time. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Some people have more time. Some people have more money. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So, how did you find that data? You're saying like, okay, I had a specific uh, like they had to have this much, this much, whatever. First American. For, there's a company called First American. They have crap loads of data. I think one other one's called List Source. But the the one provider I got off of at that time was first american that was mm. two years ago maybe three uh, i think it's 2016 that's cool okay that's good to know also you know these people are coming at you like hey i'm looking for a deal i can't find it so when you have these people like that do you partner with them or do you usually wholesale or what's the um i i i've not really wholesaled anything i oh. just mm-hmm. i, I kind of said hey i just ran into a problem property that meets your criteria here it is but i don't get too many people that do that in at least in my locality I'll try and point them in a general direction, but I kind of, I kind of get fed up anymore. I have people say, I can't find a house. And I say, mm-hmm. Hey, go look, go look at 99 East main street. Mr. So-and-so owns it. He has to sell. You can get that house for $35,000 right now. Mm-hmm. There's $25,000 worth of work. So you're going to have 60 K in it. It's going to be worth 120,000 fair market value. You can get 1500 a month out of it. And Jeez. then, and then they, they always have the same response. Well, no, and I say, <laughs> no, you're going to make money on this, but it's not what I want. I, you know, then I have a follow up of, I thought you wanted money. Yeah. Well, I do, do, but it's not in the neighborhood that I like. It's not, it's a multifamily. I only want single family detached. It doesn't have a garage brand. Brandon, the bedrooms are on the second floor. Brandon, there, you can only fit five cars in the parking lot. Brandon, it's not in the property. It's excuses. It's <laughs> and it's, it's, and they said, and I run into these people all the time. And I said, well, you know, in, in my opinion, I want to go where the money is. Yeah. And so at this point I tell them, I say, Hey, you know, that, that my kind of canned response is if you want a property, here's what I would do. And I kind of mm-hmm. give them a, probably a less verbose speech. Like I, mm-hmm. uh, as far as we've had in this interview up to this point, I mm-hmm. give them this kind of real generic, generic. Hey, if you want to go make some calls, you want to go hit the street. That's what I would do. Mm-hmm. Because at this point I, I give these guys, I've given a lot of people deals and mm-hmm. they don't want them. I, and to me, that's why we need more investors because there's all these different market segments that I think that are valuable and profitable and are great. Yeah. And people say they only want to buy three twos with a two car garage in a specific school district. That's what Jeez. they've done. <laughs> Follow up. I, I, you know, it's like I had this kid and he said, Brandon, you know, I, I hear that you're the biggest landlord. And I personally know that. Or I know, I know this kid, but he's, He's never asked me how many rentals you had. And this is right after I bought the laundromat that I do the YouTube videos. I said, how many rentals do you have? I said, 90. He said, I've never met a human being that has over two. I said, cool. Now I'm going to say some awful things here real soon. I said, that's really cool. I'm happy to hear that. And I said, if you would like to, we can go hang out for a day or two and we can meet at my laundromat and I can show you the rentals there. We can drive around to some of the properties that I've got rehabs on and you can see it. And he said, I don't want to do that, Brandon. And I said, and this is the, this is the part you might have to edit out here. I said, why? And he says, well, Grant Cardone says that's stupid to buy those kinds of properties. <laughs> I said, so what do you want? And he said, I only want to buy hundred unit multifamilies in the South. Jeez. And I said, do you realize you live in a market where people in the Bay Area would kill to live in, where we, we can buy a house for fifty thousand dollars and mm-hmm. it'll rent for eight hundred dollars every day of the week? I said, you live in the promised land. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, the houses are a little dirty, but they're everywhere. Yeah, but I don't want to do this, Brandon. <laughs> I said, oh, no. so you, don't want, you don't want to spend two days with me? Because I was at a lull for a little bit, and I was bored and didn't have anything to do. Hey, you want to go hang out and look at properties together? Sean and I do it all the time. I talk about my buddy Sean. He's a big real estate investor. Well, we used to do it all the time. Mm-hmm. We've done it like two times since I've done the YouTube channel, which is just which is disappointing. But it's like... So you don't want to spend time with Brandon driving around looking at this stuff? Well, no, because I, I, I read a book and it says that there, that's not the way that you make money. You have, you have to do this one thing. Jeez, okay. 
Yeah, I'm like being able to tour with you like around property seems like awesome. I would love to do that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of people. I, you know how many times I've been stood up? Geez, that's interesting. I'm I'm surprised. I mean, okay, so like you know me and maybe like people in my network, right? They might have the money, and then you know you said like there's we need investors and stuff like that, right? So yeah. do you think it's a good idea for you know? like my community to be like, oh, I want to invest out of state and then work with people like yeah. you guys. Yeah, the mm -hmm. big thing is finding a great management team. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you get on bigger pockets and look at the lawsuits of people selling properties in Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, mm -hmm. you've got to be very careful. You've got to have, a, if you specifically live in like the Bay Area and you want to invest in Ohio or the Midwest, mm -hmm. part of your process just isn't an acquisition. It has to be on management team vetting and determining and building a process for finding good management or building good management. Mm -hmm. And then you've just kind of got, got to go at it from that perspective. <laughs> I've talked to a couple guys recently. I said, well, that's, I really want to do a syndication someday and just syndicate a hundreds and hundreds yeah. of these little houses because the be yields cool. on them are so good. And, uh, you know, some, the first house I bought, I paid 25 for, I put another 25 in and it's worth 150 now. So it's tripled in value wow. and it rents still for a thousand dollars a month. And I've had wow. no vacancy on it and since uh, last part of 2013. So wow. there's nice, there's nice properties out there and there's nice deals. I, they, they just don't end up on my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are more interested in the disasters, unfortunately, I think than the, uh, seems like it go really well. So. Yeah. So you said you got to find a good property management company. Like what are some ways you can do that? You think we're an out of state. I don't know if this is legal, but I would try and find people that uh, use them as management and call them and ask how, what, how they like them and how long they've been with them. Okay. I don't know whether you can do that or not, but that's what I would do if I was looking for a manager, which I'm not. <laughs> like kind of looking, do you manage yeah, all, I, all of your properties or do you? Yeah. Yeah, oh, wow. that's, point I do. that's why I said at the onset of the conversation, I said, that's why I'm really trying to processize and systemize everything mm. in between the, at 90 rentals, I could self-manage it all. I've got people that, uh, I've got contractors that help me with maintenance and do maintenance calls and stuff like that. But for the management lease up, everything like that, I manage it. And mm -hmm. at 90, it was okay. And at 140, it's garbage. I, it's 140 is too much for me. Yeah, I know. So I've bought, I'm bringing people, more people on my team for the management asset aspect. Where I'm trying to systemize everything so then I can look at scaling beyond 140. But at this point, till I get that done, I 140 is my, yeah. my limit at this point for self management. But, you know, I've talked to some managers and they have one full, I know one manager locally, they have one manager per 50 properties, which to me is really freaking low. I would think that I could, I should be able to do 100 properties per manager. Yeah, because um, like my time spent on ma the management aspect and renovation management and the lease ups and mm -hmm. the clean out. I don't do the clean outs, but I have to go in and schedule the work and stuff. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I could do a hundred if I had, you know, the proper setup. Easy. Finding good managers is very important. Yeah, I know. For sure. Speaking of renovation, like, do you renovate all your product? Uh, properties um, you said or you organize it usually and I, I it. find contract I, I oversee it and find contractors okay which usually works pretty good I've got a lot of contractor horror stories that I could go over but um yeah this this, this interview is going to be hours and hours <laughs> yeah. how do you learn how to like do all that stuff like uh, I mean trial. at least like yeah learn how to renovate yourself first right and then you oh learn. um not really. Oh, you didn't? Oh, okay. I watched, watched a lot of YouTube videos and okay. to people that are knowledgeable about it and then dealt with the, the first hire I made was a guy that was fed up with a landlord in town because she was underdoing everything. She was just putting the worst materials mm -hmm. in and skimping out. And he quit because she, the landlord was skipping out. Mm -hmm. And I said early on, I'm like, that's the kind of person I want that doesn't want to cut corners and wants to do things the right way. And that contract has been working with me ever since. Mm -hmm. She had hired, she was sending a lot of work that way for the contractor and he was kind of in a tough, tough pinch at that point. And mm -hmm. here we are six years later and I'm still using some of the same contractors, at least the ones they had early on. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've hired other ones in the, the past and it hasn't worked out. But, uh, kind of sticking around with them, see, watching the process that they, the contractors use and trying to learn mm -hmm. through osmosis o over them has helped me a ton. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Uh, that makes sense. You, the internet sure helps with like YouTube and things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to kind of studying markets, right? Like if uh, I'm an out-of-state person, I don't really know too much about like Ohio, for example. Like what would you recommend in terms of how to study like, okay, this block might be better, this one or this zip code might be Depending on the market you're specifically talking about in Ohio, there's some markets that just don't have almost any data. Mm-hmm. And in those situations, essentially, I would say, hey, go fly in and get in the car and start driving around neighborhoods to see if they're good or not. Because it's easy for somebody out of state, especially if you're selling like tr- looking at a turnkey provider or somebody that's selling you listings. Mm. It's so easy to like in Columbus, I could show you where the street on one side of the street, there's million dollar houses. On the other side of the street, there's a uh, hundred thousand dollar houses and you'll get shot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on, the <shit>. other side, <laughs> yeah. on the other side of the streets, really nice houses that whole foods is on one side of the street. And on the other side of the streets, a bunch of crack houses and you're, wow. you're, you'll get shot. And uh, I've seen companies come in and people and investors come in and they buy them on the wrong side of the street, looking at comps on the other side of the street. The, the left side of the street's the nice one. The right side of the street's the terrible. Wow. So, so it's block by block uh, there, huh? Like it can be, crazy. it can be, or it yeah. can be an entire zip code that's a war zone, or it's a you know there's certain aspects. Well, within two miles of this place, it's a good landmark. So if you have a data driven approach, you have to have an area or a place that has lots of rentals. And sometimes mm-hmm. when you get into war zone, class D type properties, mm-hmm. there's not enough data because you might have one specific landlord that locks it up mm-hmm. and he, his way of marketing his rentals is putting a sign in the yard. And in that, that jurisdiction, that area, you just drive around and look for signs in the yard and that's how you find rentals. There's still a lot of that around here. Not everybody puts them on Zillow or Trulia or Realtor.com. There's a lot of people that do signs. A lot of people do only Facebook. A lot of people do mm-hmm. only Craigslist. A lot of people only do apartments.com. And so there, I'm not aware of any really good data aggregation service for that stuff. But then I don't know that there would be one that I would suggest if there was, because I still see a lot of old timey landlords that uh, have a large percentage of a marketplace still do signs and the freaking newspaper people. I mean, I know landlords still buy newspaper ads. Mm. yeah so you're still you're kind of staying in ohio right you're not gonna like uh, i don't have any desire at this point i I told a couple people if i would buy any more like outside of my little comfort zone area of ohio might look like atlanta just because i like atlanta and it doesn't Mm -hmm. freeze down there and i hate dealing with frozen pipes that's like the bane of my existence but (laughs) you know it's one of those things where there's money and there's money in frozen pipes. So, you know, but uh, I talk to guys that are in Texas and they, there's all sorts of specific areas of Texas they're insane about. I mean, guys from you know, Indiana. I know guys in Chicago. I've got a guy flying in from Chicago Monday to meet with me to do a collab on the YouTube stuff. And uh, he's a big time Chicago guy. He loves Chicago. Nice. Mm-hmm. And I look at Chicago and I would, wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of different people in different markets that find a way to make money and be profitable. Yeah, I guess you kind of have to, I mean, if you don't live in those areas, you'd have to maybe talk to people and then like, if you can drive by it, but it's, it might be harder. I don't know, but it sounds like those are the options you really have, right? That's, that's what I would do. Cause I keep making this joke to people. One of these days I'd love to make it a reality would be, I've, I, they, they, I've had that conversation with people for what markets would you want? And I, the two that come up out of my specific region are Atlanta, Georgia, and Brownsville, Texas. Hmm. And people say Brownsville, Texas. I said, they said well, why would you buy there? That's on the border with Mexico. And there's this, there's, I said, that's where the space export is. And they're going to launch rockets from there soon and houses there. I can buy them for $50,000 a piece. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's hundreds of them for sale. And I, they said, Oh, well, what would that look like? How would you specifically do it? And I said, well, I would go buy a camper and I would live in a camper driving from oh. area of area to, of Brownsville, Texas to see what areas I like to meet with locals and set up a team. And, you know, I've met a couple people say, oh, that's hardcore. I would do that. And I've met a lot of people say, well, I can't, how do you remotely do that? I'm sure there's a way to remotely manage all that stuff and to prospect and to set the systems up remotely. But I'm more of a hands-on guy and that's, you know, that's what I would do. That makes sense. So you like book something there, have like a bunch of teams you might talk to or like agents or whatever already set up type of thing. That's that's a good idea. Cool. And then when it comes to, okay, like, I guess we kind of briefly talked about financing and stuff, right? So how about someone who had like no money, right? So someone who's starting out, he's like, 
inspired by your channel and is like, okay, I could probably figure out a way to start buying these properties. Yeah. What do you suggest for someone who has like no money or like well, barely? Any here's money? where I really heavily pitch my channel. And I did a, I've done a video on how I bought a house for $250 through a master oh, lease, an auction. And that oh, a master lease with an option summed up really quickly is where you go in and you ask essentially for commercial lease on a house. And in, as a part of the lease agreement, you get unequivocal control of every little aspect of the house. And then you have an option price that can be exercised at some point in the future for a set uh, a price. Mm -hmm. And the price is whatever the mortgage is. And your, in those cases, and I have uh, several of those, the, 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 the option, the monthly fee that I pay, the master lease, well, sorry, the, the master lease portion, it's not payable to the owner of the property, it's payable to their bank. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I pay the bank. And I can exercise an option for the mortgage. So mm -hmm. if I have unequivocal control through a master lease and I have the right to purchase that property for whatever the mortgage payoff is, then who cares if my name's not on the deed? As far okay. as I'm concerned. Is this, a, is this a method that like can work with most people that they can try to do this? It, it's available in most municipalities. I've even talked to a couple people in California that said, yeah, you can do a master lease option here and not get in too much trouble. It's the, the, it's a really good way to get around bank requirements because I've threatened a, a couple people said, you're going to get sued Brandon because you can't sell or finance an apartment complex. And I said, eh, yeah, yeah, you can. And you know, I had a, very angry banker call me and they said, you're trying to sell or finance this place and we won't allow it. And I said, show me in the mortgage documents where you don't allow an option or a, a lease, a master lease. And they couldn't find it. And I said, so you're telling me that a bank has the right to sue and foreclose on everybody that has a commercial piece of real estate with a lease in place. And the, the, the mortgage broker's like, well, I, we can't, I don't know, but we can do it here. I said, no, you can't. Either you'd have to foreclose on everybody mm -hmm. <laughs> with every single house in your entire bank with worth billions of mortgage loans and assets, or you don't do it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do it. You're, mm -hmm. you're not, you can't, there's no way around this. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're upset because here, Hillbilly Brandon is the guy managing and controlling the property. It's not your guy over here with a W-2 high, high paying job that just can't manage the property anymore and can't deal with tenants anymore. That's the situation. So that guy can either sell it, but he's, he's, he can't, he's upside down because the tenant strikes the place mm. or you can foreclose on it. Or mm. you can let a guy like me, Hillbilly Brandon, that doesn't mind killing and cat urine with, the, with kills. Brandon's going to deal with that. This mm. guy over here that's a doctor with a 500K a year salary that mm. decided he wanted to buy a sixplex or an eightplex or whatever it is, the doctor over here can't deal with it, but I can. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, you know, from that perspective, it's helping everybody involved in the situation. Yeah. Well, well, still, we don't like seller financing. Well, you're going, you're going to, you're going to, I'm going to get away with it. There's nothing you guys can do. I'm sorry. Nice. That's, that's what I do. They're very advantageous. One size fits all for everybody. It's like, as an investor, I think that you have to have this big, treasure chest of ideas and strategies and options and things that you can do to get a deal done. Yeah. And you know, you start off having one or two methods that you think will work. And mm -hmm. as time goes on, you get more and more and more methods to where you've got a hundred methods. And I talked to, I've talked to guys with near a thousand units and they said, it's, at this point, it's not, it's not buying another rental. It's finding some silly freaking way to, to, to do the deal. You know, I'm going to buy a hotel, hotel i want to buy a, a hilton hotel unit and i want to get a million dollars cash back at closing and i talk to guys that do stuff want to do stuff like that you know, so I, year later yeah did you buy one no i bought two of them brandon i met a guy outside la and he said i wanted to flip a warehouse and make a mm -hmm. million dollars wow. it. i wanted to flip a property in an industrial park Mm -hmm. And he messaged me six months later, or I talked to the guy six months later. I said, did you do it? And he said, well, only kind of. And he said, I did a glorified uh, BRRR. You know, I bought a warehouse. I renovated it. I subleased space and made, took it from a 200,000 square foot warehouse into four 50K units. I had mm -hmm. it appraised. I, I had 1.5 million in it. I had it reappraised at $3 million. I told the bank I wanted a million off of it. And I cash flow. 15k a month now oh. and he said i didn't get to flip it but with no money out of pocket so That's he did, did that deal and i said so 
this you didn't want to buy this property did you and i said i said you don't don't really need anything at this point do you and he said nope it's just for fun now at this point wow. i just wanted to see if i could do it and i did it <laughs> and it's the same guy that's in the process of building a pretty large subdivision in, in hmm. california that's crazy and then you know you talked about how like in the beginning someone wired you like 90k and then later like someone gave like was like i need uh, someone to, or someone to spend like a mill or whatever of my money so like yeah. how how do you work that out with the the person who's gonna fund it so is it like a 50 50 every, thing that's cash flow or something? every every single one's different and that's kind of the thing that i try to avoid talking about because every deal that i've done is different oh, okay. i don't really talk talking specific equity splits and interest rates because i've got guys that are low interest, low equity. Mm. And I've got other guys that I've, in some aspects, I've given the world away to. I've got some guys that are on locked payments, like I pay eight or 9% of their investment to. I've got other guys that I don't have any guarantee to whatsoever. Mm. Okay. Um, and so it just, it, just it varies. Ra varies, it ranges. And mm -hmm. then the thing is too, though, from what I've told people, you know, when you're starting out and you have no experience, you have to sell your soul. You have to give all that, all that potential profitability away in my opinion to kind of show that you can get it done mm -hmm. not that you have to do it on every deal but i felt like early on you know i did some of these deals where i only had 35 percent equity in them oh, and okay. i did them early on and i i was able to call equity back to where now i'm by far the majority stakeholder in the the property mm -hmm. and then you know a lot of other ones i've completely bought everybody out on them and it's just varied from deal to deal to deal and structure 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 interesting yeah something one thing might make sense on a just trailer park but it won't make sense on a freestanding or you know one-off duplex so yeah you have all this info like you know so much about real estate like were there any resources you studied when you first started out before you even like um, bought everything that you I, recommend I, 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 the biggest one i think was a mindset changer and it was my buddy i call him my buddy but he's my mentor who's the former CEO of an oil company and he was mm -hmm. the CEO for 25 or 30 years. And he just changed my mind so much on business, just mm -hmm. how a, from a CEO's perspective, how to get things done. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind. Cause he's a very hands-on CEO. Mm -hmm. He, he freaking ran a bulldozer to try and abide by a timeline that the EPA had given his company to deal with an EPA mitigation issue. And the guys running the, the Bobcat to, tear out a storage or a underground leaky underground storage tank. And they had like mm -hmm. two hours before the EPA was going to find them like $50,000. And he jumped on the Bobcat or the machine and dug the rest of the thing out. And, you know, they, 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 we would have conversations like that. And then he would teach, he would, he would have these stories about when he was in the military and there was a bridge collapsing and he had to go and rescue and pull people out of a uh, uh, M 35 deuce and a half. And then there would be other stories about how he, personally manages defined, fin de defined pension plans. No, no. Talk to a millennial or a Gen Z about a defined pension plan. And they'll say, well, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. well, pension plans, what the boomers have, um, <laughs> where they get, they get all their medical and all their, their money paid. And he, he'd have these crazy insights and on that. And then, so he taught me a lot. And then he would, he would point people out that I thought were well off financially. Mm -hmm. And I thought he would say, no, they're not. Go ask them about, go ask them where their money's coming from. Go and, go and ask them this thing that deals with finance. And then I'd find out that I, my pers perspective of finance was completely wrong. Or my perspective on wealth mm -hmm. was wrong. Mm -hmm. wrong. And then as a real estate agent, because I've had my real estate license since so, uh, mm -hmm. 06, and people that would come into my office as an agent and they would come in with a cash offer. I'd say, hey, I don't mean to be nosy but you're very successful. I would love to know how you're successful. Hmm. And I had very few people not tell me. They'd spill the, spill the whole beans on their, everything they were doing. They just want They're to like talking about themselves. <laughs> right. People, love, people yeah. love talking about money. And if you come off to someone as honest and say, I want to learn, yeah, I true. have very, I see very few people that say no. Almost everybody wants to help somebody else. I think, mm. I think by nature, people want to be altruistic. Yeah. They, want, they want to help people. Mm -hmm. But I think that we've got kind of got this weird societal issue where we don't ask people for help. We don't people ask people for advice. We want to feel like we have all the answers. So when you come off to somebody and say, hey, I think you have the answers here. I'd love to know what they are. And you're honest and transparent about what you're, you're trying, to, trying mm -hmm. to learn from them. I think people have very high success rates. So that, that's from a personal aspect. I'm not too big on book reading, which is hilarious because I talk to all these people. They, what, what are your top 10 books? And I'm like, I honestly could not name you 10 books. <laughs> 
Wow. I, I <laughs> often, it's like uh, rich dad, poor dad, richest man in Babylon, how to win friends and influence people. And it's like, that's about it. Those are like kind of more mindset too, right? Usually. Yeah. And those are the, those are the ones I like. And those, uh, that's about it, unfortunately. And I read a lot of stuff on bigger pockets. Yeah. And bigger I, pockets. I, is good. I get on real estate investing on Reddit pretty often. They don't oh, like okay. too much anymore, but uh, <laughs> I get on Wait, why? they don't uh, like, I, they don't like people posting about either uh, talking about YouTube on there. Oh, got it. Okay. But yeah, those, yeah, I think those are even like good resources though. You know, just checking yeah, they're, on Reddit. They're very good. If, if, I, you know, if you get on Reddit on the real estate investing and just do by top all time, all time top posts, just read mm. the first two pages. I think it would provide them. It's about, about, that's good advice. Because if you get on there, you'll see, you'll see about a 5,000 word essay, word essay of how I got my first 50. So there's, there's resources out there like that. Bigger pockets, I think is invaluable, but it, to me, mm-hmm. it comes down to a, a situation where, what are you investing your time in? Are you watching cat memes on YouTube or are you watching you study? <laughs> are you binge watching stranger things? I had a conversation with a kid that I really like. I appreciate him very much. We we're talking about uh, what do you spend your time on? He says, well, I invest my time in the office. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I've watched it three times. <laughs> all seasons? He said, yeah. So we sat down with a calculator. We figured out how much time you spent on that. It was a lot. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> you know, if you get in the mindset and the desire to learn these things, you know, that learn the stuff. I, I don't, I don't know that there's a specific in, that I can say you have to spend 2000 hours of research to be a real estate investor and be successful. But I think if that's your passion and you start investing time like that, it'll eventually happen. It's a little mm-hmm. different for everybody, but I think it's just one of those things that's going to happen. Yeah, no, for I, sure. if, believe me, if I can do it, I failed algebra. The most I, I, I was D a D average on algebra one. Nice. <laughs> <Just completely laughs> wrote up algebra two terrible at math and everything like that. I grew up poor. I've been evicted twice. I'm trying to think of all the hardships. My dad was a truck driver. I'm trying to think of the other sob story stuff. But um, when, 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 I was, when I was 18, my dad had a heart attack. And my brother and I had to go out and get jobs. Oh, um, mm-hmm. So I never went to college, those kinds of things. All the sob story stuff that would get me on America's Got Talent if I could sing or do something <laughs> like that. But, uh, I eventually I realized I had to start investing my time in something a little more noteworthy than video games and stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But uh, yeah, just, no. I think I think that you'll figure it out. But bigger pockets and Reddit are pretty decent resources right off the bat. Yeah, that's that's great. So if you were to start over, if you didn't have a network, you had like not much money. What's some advice for people? Like, you know, like what would you do? You know, if you were um, in that position, I, I wish that for me personally, I would have joined my RIA, my local real estate investor association, a heck of a lot earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I put it off because I figured I'd be an idiot. And I would ask a bunch of stupid questions. And I found mm-hmm. out that in our RIA, people love stupid questions. They love stupid They love it. <laughs> I okay. love stupid questions because it means I get to answer something. But the, the kind of the caveat there is you have to be willing to accept the answer a lot of times. Yeah. Worst, the worst thing you can do is say, hey, I want your advice. And then you, someone gives you some good advice or advice period. And they say, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the one, that's helpful tip there. Don't, uh, tip, don't do that. Okay. No. So the local art RIA thing, RIA, you, sh- yeah. you should join that, right? The association. Yep. It's awesome. Okay. So where can people find more information about you? I know like people are going to be interested in this interview, like learning more um, about you. Investment Joy on YouTube, Investment Joy on Instagram. And I've got a little teeny tiny uh, Facebook page under Investment Joy. And I've got the first, I, I just found all my old videos and pictures from the very first house that I redid. Uh, okay. People can see that I do own some nice houses. <laughs> Three minute video breaking down some of the finances on it. So those would be the best ways to get a hold of me or find out and watch my content or whatever. And I, as it is today, I've responded to every single message I've got. So I try to make myself available to people that have questions and whatnot. So. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for speaking with me. I feel like people cool. are going to learn so much from this and I've learned I a lot. So. From it. Yeah. I thank you so, so much. Yeah. Cool. Right. So thanks again and see you guys later.